Thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure to, to talk. Good morning. Uh, after a long break, uh, back to the conference. I really like the environment, the vibe of like PyCons in general. I, I'm happy to talk. The idea of the talk is like a, a beginner talk or a introduction to data engineering in Python. Um, it's a very dense uh, content you have. There's a lot of uh, topics to cover, but uh, I wanted to give some uh, disclaimers right now. Uh, before introduction is that, of course, I'm not endorsed or uh, by any conference or foundation or company, so opinions is uh, my own. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a very dense content, so I had it because we have like just 25 minutes I had to uh, to short a bit the content here, so feel free to post your comments, feedbacks, or questions uh, in the channel in Discord or approach me. Uh, I will be in the conference until the end. Uh, uh, this, code, uh, this talk you won't cover uh, any live code, unfortunately. Even I prepared some uh, some demo, uh, we won't be able to to make it. And also, it's not about platforms in general or uh, operational uh, codes. Uh, so let's start a brief introduction about mine. So. I'm originally from Brazil. Uh, uh, currently, I'm living in, in Berlin uh, for almost eight years. Uh, I started writing code uh, 20 years ago. Uh, I learned it. Uh, my first book was like uh, this book, How to Think Like a Computer Scientist, like Science Python 2.2, long time ago. And since then, Python has been followed my, my life. And 10 years ago, I transitioned to data engineer, data words, because I was working like in a small startup. They required like gathering data from around the world, and then I had to learn, and then I fell in love about the, the data world, and then start to, uh, to, to go deep into that. Currently, uh, I am working for Delivery Hero as a data engineer expert, uh, helping them to uh, find new technologies and to evolve the platform. Before I worked for GitHub, Microsoft, and other uh, big companies uh, uh, around the world. Uh, also, I have like a consultant uh, small company where I, I help like small startups or uh, stealth startups to uh, spin uh, their uh, data, data words. Um, today, uh, our intention here is to discuss like a bit of data engineer fundamentals, like uh, relying on the Python. So then you're gonna see like a bit of uh, anatomy of uh, any data product. So it tends to be like uh, standards. Uh, I would you like to talk about basically eight topics uh, covering all the aspects of a data product, but I have to elect just the three that I, I consider the most important. So today we're going to talk about workflow management, or specifically buyer flow, and distributed computation. Uh, today you're going to cover PySpark, so you had a great uh, I've had a great uh, keynote today about polars that also uh, is not directly related with distributed computing but also helps a lot to this uh, scale processing. And the most important that I think for data engineer nowadays, science like most of the problems are still solved. Uh, but it's about uh, testing and validating your data to avoid reworking, to avoid, uh, to be more efficient. So it's one thing that people in general doesn't discuss and um, Python provides a lot of nice tools to, to test your data. Uh, test your data as you test your code is very important. Uh, I designed this this presentation for uh, people who is like introducing to data engineer talk. So you have a bit of knowledge in, in Python. Uh, you want to dismissify uh, about uh, like the data engineer. It's not uh, like a monster. Even uh, you have like several components tooling. Uh, it's not like really uh, complex. Uh, tends to be like a bit more uh, sometimes boring. I would say, but like. It's not that thing. 
and why you need to discuss data engineer fundamentals in general like uh, when you see like most of the companies or the blog posts, the tech blog posts the, of these big companies or medium-sized companies like they advocate for like how they process data in a scale and then like you need to glue different components you need to glue and make a lot of magic it looks like it's very very difficult to do and they in general when they solve like a scale problem they try to sell for us from the community as like a silver bullet to solve the problems and, and when I decided to propose this talk for, for the PyCon, it's because I came from like a big tech and then I started to see like, okay, uh, data engineer is nice, okay, but like the traditional method is still adequate for, for that. Like I, I process like tons and tons of data like in a traditional way. Of course, I see people advocate like new ways to processing data in general but sometimes you have like a conflict because it, when you sell like a new approach, you tend to like to say that another approach is not really good or decade, but here I'm um, to say like, the fundamentals of the data engineer is still adequate for a, any case. Uh, of course, you need to uh, reach the efficiency, you need to be like cost effective somehow, but it's what you're gonna discuss a bit here in four topics mainly. Um, I put the pragmatism uh, word in my uh, the title because pragmatism tends to be uh, uh, thinking about like solving real problems. Um, I see like some um, parts when I when I join to consult with some companies or uh, to help like. Uh, teams in general, how they tend is to focus on tooling or how to get like the silver bullets from the, the tech giants and try to apply, but they don't think like, I want you to solve my real problem here. And why to, to solve the real problem? Because uh, there's like a cliche that says that the data is the new oil, the new energy in the world. And then like uh, probably your company, your business, uh, rely on data even if they are not the data is the product so be pragmatic on this these ways basically thinking the real problem start like simple and try to evolve along the time because you have like techniques to to make it you don't need to think in a silver bullet thinking in, in how big your data you be like in three four or one two three years right and why Pythonic? So you are in a Python conference. Like the fundament of the Python is like that you have like multiple ways to make some 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 task to, to reach like some some goals. Like and Pythonic is a, 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 a principle for uh, you can read. Uh, it's simple and uh, explicit and efficient. So if you go to the Python uh, Zen. You can see like some some sentences there, but like what I like, it's like complex is better than complicated. As I mentioned before, like data engineer tends to be complex, but they don't need it to be complicated because you have like several problems already solved. You just need to use them, and but you can continue to be simple even you are over in a complex scenario, and it might be beefed be beautiful. Probably it's because we choose Python as our main uh, technology or it's because we're here. Because Python is really simple, it's really uh, idiomatic, so you feel comfortable to learn, it's easy to spread your knowledge and you can be explicit for the, the people. It's because you don't need to be have implicit your configurations uh, and then you can read your code and be happy. So you can just see it and and understand what's happening there. Uh, data engineer is not a monster because, uh, in fact, the data engineer in a simple sentence is like turn messy data for any kind into structured data. It's organized and you need it to be it's accessible for everyone. Who it's accessible depends who you access. Is your machine, is a computer, or is a human, but they need it to be reliable 
efficient. Efficient means like affordable costs in general, or you need to uh, process like such uh, amount of data like in a, in a small time, and you need to scale up it easily. How to scale up easily depends of the tool that you are using. But like the main components that link all this tooling, uh, what you're gonna discuss uh, today. And why do you need data engineer? Uh, mostly because uh, if you are not uh, probably a data analyst or like you are not running like in a super scale, uh, in general, your data doesn't fit in your machine or you need to process it like efficiently way. So you need like distribute the computation, uh, mostly of the tools uh, you want uh, uh, solve your problem. So it's because the role of the data engineer they have like they can help uh, you to understand what's the best approach to be pragmatic to solve this, this, this problem. As I mentioned before, if the data is not part of your business, probably the data is your business. Like if you process data in a scale or if you use the data or you sell data in general, so it's because the data engineers tends to be a core a role in the companies. And the most important, like we are in a Python conference, but why you choose Python in general? First, because like you have like a huge amount of resources available uh, at this point. So basically any problem with data can be solved with Python today. Even they are uh, developing another text and another stacks in general, they have some kind of uh, SDK, they have some kind of library that like you can play with Python. Another thing is like the growing ecosystem because you have like many tutorials, many blog posts, like the documentation for the Python, uh, Python uh, libraries are really amazing. So they are well maintained, they are updated. Uh, in general, the Python open source projects are open like with like kind people, so you can contribute it a lot. And as I mentioned, they are integrated with the most of the most important tools today. If you see like in the list, so mostly people use like in fact like the uh, Apache ecosystem. Uh, Airflow is the only uh, Python uh, writing tool here, but like if you use uh, Spark for like computing, for distribute your computing, or Kafka for your messaging, for your events, Hive for manage your data warehousing, or to use like the Met Store if you wanted to catalog your, your data, the Elastic Stack, uh, also is, is, is Java, so if you want to have like a document database, a login, or even dashboards, or if you wanted to use your Presto to, like, to have like a layer on top of your uh, data warehousing uh, in order like to, to have a SQL engine for uh, works and also uh, the biggest player for the data warehousing today support Python natively so it means that you can create like uh, user defined functions in Python and deploy directly like for BigQuery, Redshift or Azure Synapse and each others. It's really interesting because you are here to, to discuss. This is the, uh, um, the anatomy of a data product in general, like if you see in our uh, left side, so we have, um, yes, in the right side, uh, you have like multiple sources. Sources in general are unstructured data, so you might have any kind of data here, data coming from IPIs, images, uh, CSVs, JSON, binary formats, uh, methods, and in general, sources in general are divided in three uh, main categories. The, the batch, basically you get a, a bunch of data and bring it to a, a, a computer or to multiple computers and you process like in batch. You have event, basically uh, when a system, when an application like emits some data to your application, in general if you through uh, a message system, uh, imagine that you have like uh, an application and they are emitting events for like, like user behavior, for example, it's internal changes to be event. 
Also, if you have like a relational databases around your stack and then instead you need to push this data to process, to, to have some analysis, instead you do these snapshots, it means like you take the data every day, you take the dump of your database and push it to your data, uh, to the, your data lake, data warehousing. Uh, also, you have like some process quality, for example, CPC, that like when you change some role in your relational database, they meet an event for a, a message system to say like this row was updated or was deleted, was inserted, and then you can update in your, on your side as well. Or even streaming, streaming in general, like data coming, flowing, flowing from different applications, also through uh, messages. In general, in the middle, you have like a data store, uh, distributed data store, like in the past, you are using to use Hadoop. Uh, nowadays, we are using the cloud uh, storage in general, uh, S3, uh, Azure storage, Google uh, storage, and then you have like the transformation, uh, cleaning this data, enhancing this data, Commonly, transformation is called sometimes the ETL, is the T from the ETL, and then this is like iterative process, and then you have like the a presentation. Presentation means like uh, you store your data, and then, for example, you can plot it in a dashboard, you can have like a BI system, or you can have like a, a, a small presentation, of course, of the, your data, or you can even like have a transportation layer that means that you can expose part of your data as an API or in another way. But the most important is like the last line that is orchestration and observability. Like this means like that you have an assistant that is always observing all the steps of your uh, data products. Uh, what you're gonna talk today is about the airflow that's like a workflow management. They, you can create like several points as a graph and then was a tree that you can uh, you can uh, manage uh, all these steps of this uh, data product. And to observe your data, how to observe your data, it means like that you then you can see how, what's happening with your data, the quality of your data, if the process is happening uh, as expected, and then you need to send also this data to another system to observe this data that it can alert you in case something wrong will happening, happening or if you have any other uh, problem. We want to cover observability today, but it's a very important part of a, a data pipeline or data products. And I'm proposing here, like very simple, like to build a data product, like just looking like in few minutes, uh, as I mentioned, my intention was to cover more tools today, but since we don't have too much uh, 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 time, uh, you want to go, you gonna cover uh, just like four uh, uh, four uh, tools. You're gonna talk like about Airflow as a workflow management, Spark or Py Spark as to distribute your computing, and Pydantic for your uh, validator models, and Great Expectations. That is a tool is about. They are pretty much similar, but they have like a slightly different. It's the Great Expectations that what expect your data, right? Uh, let's talk about an Airflow. So Airflow is a Pythonic, uh, a Pythonic project that like, uh, you are able to authoring, uh, scheduling and monitoring uh, workflows in Python. Because so you can code Python started, so you don't need to have like a dozen of YAMLs flying or like different uh, frameworks, whatever working, and they have like a built-in uh, graphical UI that you can see what's happening for you. And why? Because they are ready to use in the most uh, cloud, uh, cloud uh, platforms, or you can deploy by yourself in any other stack, in general Docker or uh, Kubernetes, uh, and most of these this use cases are for the ETL, that's most classical for data engineer, um, automated uh, reporting uh, process, uh, if you wanted to train your machine learning uh, models, or even to do like operational and backup tasks. If you wanted to push, like for example, do a snapshot, so Airflow, it's pretty much easy, and you just need to write uh, Python code. Uh, you have like mainly four concepts for uh, Airflow. So if you watch the um, 
uh, the previous keynote, so um, was explained about the DAG. DAG basically is a graph, it's a cyclic, so they have just one direction. And the DAG here, uh, it's like a, a group of tasks that depend on each other to proceed. But in Airflow, when you say a DAG, DAG is basically your Python code. You're gonna, uh, you're gonna see in the next uh, slides. And you have like the concept of now operator. Operator like is a unit of code, it's part of your deck. So it's part of a piece of code that do something. For example, read a data source or process a data source or write a data source, for example, connect it to a service. And operator generates always a task for, for you. So it's how it's generated task is the code that are running in a worker. So, and you have the templates. This is the most powerful uh, feature in the Airflow because you can use a Jinja template, like if you, you have like a similar uh, Jinja templates that you use in your applications, it's pretty much the same. You can define macros, functions, and Airflow also tend, uh, can be used with like a Jinja template, so you can access or create your macros. That's pretty much useful for you who need to extend. And important here, how their airflow works, they have like mainly five uh, uh, concepts. So you have like the meta database, where it's a relational database that store all the state from the airflow instance. Uh, what are the DAGs, the tasks, how they are running, the scheduler, and they will have the executor and the scheduler. This is a central point, is a component that like you spin up the workers. They you start to execute your works in a time that you define. Uh, there are several kind of ex executors. Uh, the most common is to use a salary for the people who use like salary for uh, message query or uh, query processing in, in, in Python, but also you can use a Kubernetes or a standalone one. You have a web server that serves a UI for you, so you have like a complete set of tools that you can manage your data. Uh, you have the workers. Workers basically are your code being running in a machine, in a, in a, in a Kubernetes uh, pod. Uh, and you have, of course, your code that how you define your DAG. You define your DAG, your operators, your tasks, your templates, and then it is run inside the Airflow uh, runtime. Easy to get started, very easy. So if you wanted to start, open uh, your terminal, PPI install uh, a patch their flow, so you have it already in your path. Uh, Airflow version, you can see like the listed version. And standalone, uh, you can start your server uh, as Airflow uh, standalone. Then you provide you a user and a passport, and then you can access your 88 port in your local host, and then you are able to see uh, this screen that basically are the example decks, but you can create yours. I have just three minutes, so you can be fast. And here, very fast, uh, probably it's not easy to read, I'm sorry. Uh, but here you have like three meanings, so how you define your deck, so you define the principles, how your deck you run, the scheduler, uh, the configuration, the operators, so there are several operators, you can create your custom operators, and then you have your templating, they are generated the tasks. The task means how you link the operator to each other, and then you create a deck. Like this code, you generate like a PyCon uh, deck for us that you generate like mainly three tasks. And then when you need to execute this, so you have like a UI that you can see uh, which steps are running and then you can see, for example, the log. Because if you are working at distributed workload, uh, then you run like an ephemeral machine, an ephemeral pod for you, and then you can access the log uh, directly from the UI. It's pretty much useful. Also, you're gonna talk uh, fast like about like PySpark here. Uh, we won't need to run your code at scale because Airflow, you can run code, but not exactly in a scale, but if you need to process data in a scale, you need to use a tooling for that. Uh, in Python world, you have a desk, for example, uh, but I choose like to use PySpark because it's most common for, uh, for now, and they have like an uh, interface for Python using uh, Python 4J, but also people who uh, tend to train their uh, machine learning models uh, 
you can use like uh, PySpark as well. And also they have a engine that you can write like SQL and CSQL codes. Um, and then this turns into, uh, let's say, behind the scenes they turn into uh, codes, a data frame, and they, they work. And the concept here is basically uh, the, the master slave is like you have a driver, driver is our application, the code that you write. Uh, you have a cluster management, they know how to spin up new machines to coordinate all these machines. And behind the scenes, what's happening, your Python code is turning into Java code. They are sending to all these workers, they work there, they make all the process they need to do. They get the results uh, from the results. Uh, they, they serialize back to Python and then uh, you have the results. So the works, uh, 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 the works make this, this magic happens. And you, uh, you pass this one. So here you have like an example how you create like a data framing in Spark. Um, basically you have the concept of rows and you can create like a data frame. Data frame is pretty much similar to uh, Pandas data frames. Uh, they work is like, behind the scenes, they work like uh, are quite different, but uh, when you define like a data frame, uh, what they do basically, they get this data that you are generated, they distribute it to the machines, they process what happens there, and they return it to the driver uh, application. Uh, another sample here is uh, basically reading a external file, a external service, doing a process of filtering and writing to a external uh, file uh, at this moment. But also the most important here that they have like pandas uh, interop. So if you are, have a legacy code using pandas, you can get your data frame, you can spread to the, Py, uh, to, to the PySpark, they you distribute over the, uh, the machines, and then they you, uh, they you process for you and get the results. Great expectations is about, uh, uh, oh yeah, 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 you finish, yeah. yeah. Uh, great expectations is about like how you test your code is to expect what you expect your code look you have like columns for example you have like a data frame in a column so what you expect from that like if you wanted to have a news duplicated so you can define uh, pretty much easy so you define this part of the code you also can um, you can integrate it with spark and pydantic that's pretty much similar to great expectations, but the concept that you define your model basically is a Python class. You annotate them with like native types, and then you can uh, create like methods for uh, custom validations. This is the part of the code, and why to use one of each other? The most important, they are validated in tools, but uh, the data validation is like uh, great expectations, is how you set the expectations of your application, so we have to expect for each uh, part of your data, but uh, like Pydantic is about uh, so custom validations. I put some references over here, and really thanks, really sorry to run a bit late. Thank you. Feel free to reach me out on LinkedIn or to Twitter X, that's BSAO, or if you want to contact me directly on Telegram, BSAO0, feel free, or I will be in the conference. Thank you so much, or in the Discord channel. Thank you.